Restraints and solitary confinement were the subject of Dr. Mary Abrigan's 1844 report to the New York State Legislature on behalf of the managers of the asylum. Dr. Brigham starts off the report by acknowledging the lack of strong rooms as a problem that could be resolved by Lining some of the rooms with boards and making stronger doors. We have made some of the rooms safe and comfortable for this class, but we have no cells or dungeons. Every patient has a good-sized room, well ventilated and warmed. The Utica State Lunatic Asylum, established to be a place free of restraints, actually was not restraint free. By its own reports, the asylum utilized restraints and solitary confinement. Dr. Brigham explained that solitary confinement in one of these rooms lasted for as long as it took the inmate to gain control over themselves and that this confinement was the chief restraint employed at the institution. However, the next paragraph in the report details different types of mechanical restraints. Brigham writes, Leather and cloth mittens and leather muffs and wristbands are our only other means of restraint. We have never had a straight jacket or restraining chair in the asylum though we probably should have used the latter occasionally had we won. We believe that sometimes restraint of this kind is far better for patients than to permit them to exhaust and injure themselves by their incessant exertions, or to have them restrained by the hands of attendants. But no restraint except for the moment is permitted here, unless by the express order of one of the officers of the house. Among our printed rules for the conduct of the attendants are the following, to which we believe the strictly adhere. The attendant is never to apply any restraining apparatus, such as muffs, mitts, etc., unless by order of a resident officer. Other methods of gaining control over the inmates utilized in the institution were explained by Brigham, in a frighteningly positive light, including The warm bath, long continued, has this effect, and cold applied to the head, especially showering the head with cold water. Medicines sometimes laxatives have this effect and also narcotics and opiates. Phoebe Davis also discussed the baths in terms of retribution inmates were subject to by their keepers if the inmate filed grievances of the staff with the doctors. The physicians would not more than get out of the halls before the help would say, no look out, madam, for next bathing day, that meant holding them under the water just as long as they dared, and more than once too. The bathing troughs are cast iron, and very heavy, and one would be surprised to see the marks of that iron trough on the limbs of patients between the foot and the knee joint. There was generally the variety of colors and shapes such as usually accompany bruises. On a number of patients who I saw it was frightful to look at them. At first I did not comprehend it, and I asked them the cause. They told me it was the effect of being pushed against the bathing troughs and the bedsteads. Despite Brigham's back and forth about not having restraints, but having them, not using restraints, unless someone says it's acceptable, Brigham still advocated for a restraint-free environment in 1844. However, by the 1856 report to the New York State Legislature in the asylum manager logs, the managers write. The expressions restraint and seclusion in the treatment of insanity, are rarely understood in their applications and relations to the individual and collective good of the inmates of an institution, even by the more intelligent of the public. The discussions in Europe and this country, on the subject, of their use, abuse, or abolition, have not tended really to enlighten the public mind. Restraint was originally, harsh and often cruel in means, and was, in some form, almost universal. The milder treatment was seclusion. By 1856, the Utica State Lunatic Asylum was utilizing multiple types of mechanical restraints. First, a camisole, or waist, laced up the back, with endless sleeves, attached in the front or not, as the case may require, to a loop on the waist. Secondly, simple, padded leather wristlets, moving on a belt about the waist. Thirdly, a leather muff and wristlet, which is the addition to the second mode of a leather shield covering the hands. Confinement to a seat is effected by passing a leather strap about the waist and attaching it behind to the chair or settee. We are of the opinion also that this moral as well as medical effect of this treatment is much better than that of seclusion. The discussion of types of restraint, preferable over seclusion continues in the asylum's manager logs. 
confinement in bed, in a horizontal position, is affected by two methods. First by an apparatus known to the general profession as a bed strap, consisting of a leather cushion, about 18 inches wide, and 22 inches long, with three straps at the top, one about the middle of it, and two at the bottom. The central top strap is fastened to the head of the bed, and the two bottom ones to the foot. The patient is then placed on the cushion. The middle strap is passed about his waist. The two straps at the top passed forward diagonally across the breast and buckled to the waist strap, then confining the body of the patient to the cushion. Two bites move on rings on the straps attached to the foot of the bed. These bites are buckled round the ankles, with a strap attached to the foot of the bed, to regulate, and in a measure, restrain the motion of the feet. This instrument of restraint is more formidable in description than in fact. This mode we rarely resort to. Phoebe Davis, when discussing the fear she saw in inmates bruised from being slammed against the bedstead and bathing troughs, writes of her inspection of the bedstead. I looked at the bedsteads, and they were about as solid as iron. They were made very heavy, with iron bands around each post, made fast with screws. That was right so far, but the side pieces had sharp corners, and they were not so pleasant to run into in a hurry, just when the attendant saw fit to give them a push. What is now known as the Utica crib was also discussed as a positive alternative to being tied with bed straps directly to a bed by the managers to the legislature in 1856. The other method, and which we greatly prefer, is a covered bed. This bed is constructed like an ordinary child's crib, with the addition of a slatted cover. This arrangement does not interfere with the movements of a patient in rolling from one side of the bed to the other, or moving the limbs in any way. It merely prevents the patient from sitting up or getting out of bed, as the sides and top are open. The air circulates as freely about the body of the patient as in an ordinary bed. Restraint in a horizontal posture is used in cases of exhaustion, where the physical health of the patient demands that he be kept in bed. The medical thought involved is readily appreciated. Sick people ordinarily lie in bed under the advice and direction of the physician, but the same class, when insane, will not always do so, and these arrangements are to effect this end. Phoebe Davis offered the context a crib patient might have known prior to being subjected to that level of treatment, suggesting They had to give me medicine for a cough I had in consequence of taking cold in the cells and in the water closet. I was obliged to have the window up all the time. It was late in the fall, cold and rainy, and no fire could reach me. I stayed in that place, and in the cells the most of the time for three weeks and when I was in the cell some of the time I had no bed clothes on my bed except some torn blankets, and they were very filthy at that. They were what some call Indian blankets. I kept what clothes I had upon me, and got into the straw just as hogs do in a cold night. The straw was damp but that was the best I could do with what I had to keep house with. The patients who lodge in the cells are generally so filthy that it is necessary to fill the beds with new straw every morning, and, rain or shine, the beds are drawn through the yard. What private family would think a straw bed fit to sleep on in that condition, without a mattress? But, crib patients are all of them put on that damp straw as soon as it is taken into the house, and also damp clothes and wet bed clothes are used. This is Mental, American, Monster, The Sprawl, of American Psychiatry, www.mentalamericanmonster.org.